Hello, everyone. This is Eric Glazer, and welcome to another live recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare, produced by Shared Purpose Connect. We bring leaders together to not only inform you, but also unearth bright spots, successes at health plans, hospital systems, and other healthcare related organizations around the country. Our goal is to identify as many bright spots as possible so that you can determine if the idea is shared during this episode can be applied at your organization. We believe this approach of finding a bright spot and cloning it is the most effective strategy to improve healthcare in our lifetime. If you have not subscribed to the Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast, this is your first time watching our webinar or listening to the show, I encourage you to go to your favorite podcast app, type in Bright Spots in Healthcare, click subscribe. Every week, you'll get episodes downloaded featuring some of the leaders around this country at incredible organizations that have ideas that have worked that you could potentially use to rethink how you go about what you do at your organization. I highly encourage you to get access to all the great content. Go to brightspotsandhealthcare.com if you want to see a list of all of our past guests and episodes. Our topic today is chronic condition management and how to do a better job managing individuals living with chronic conditions with fewer resources. We have a tremendous panel roundtable uh, that we have produced for you uh, this afternoon, featuring Dr. Robert Groves, the Chief Medical Officer and Executive VP at Banner Health in Arizona, Dr. Radhika Kumar, Vice President of Market Clinical Solutions and Pharmacy Services in Philadelphia, Independence Blue Cross, and the CEO and co-founder of Scene Health, our sponsor for today, I'll tell you about that in a second, Sebastian Sagar, who has been a regular guest on the show. They've got some incredible stories to share with you as well. Uh, a little bit of, if you have not heard about Scene Health, they are an industry leader in med engagement. They go beyond traditional medication adherence to transform disease management. I'm going to tell you a bit more about them and some of the cool things they are doing later on during the episode. But if you want to check them out right now, you can go to scene.health to learn more. They're an incredible partner to the Bright Spot Show, and we thank them for partnering with us on all these great programs. Let's start. I want to get right into it. Oh, by the way, if you want to co-moderate with me, all of you who are watching live, uh, you can uh, use the Q&A module, and our producer, Sherry Keels, and I will try to triage them. We have a tight schedule today, so we may only be able to fit in a couple of questions, so don't get mad at me if we don't get them all in, but certainly as questions come in, throw them in. I'll try to incorporate them into our discussion. Uh, also, uh, if you want the full bios of our illustrious panel in front of you, we're going to post that in the chat and in the description of the show. If you're listening to the podcast, you're on a walk right now, you pull that up and you could see the incredible experience uh, that you are about to benefit from. Finally, in about five minutes, 10 minutes before the show is over, we're going to be emailing you again. I'm going to be emailing you again, I know, for you live attendees, some feedback, asking you for some feedback about future topics and how we did today and how we can make it better. We continue to refine the show. Sometimes it's not totally transparent to you guys watching and listening, but we do things behind the scenes based upon all the feedback we gather up from that survey that we sent out to you. So uh, we will look at them all. The survey is designed to be completed in two or three minutes. Thank you in advance for doing that. Let's start with bright spots. We're going to jump right into stories. And I think a lot of these examples will be transferable to some of uh, our audience's organizations. And even if the example can't be copied and pasted, the core principles and processes will be. So we're going to have some fun here. I want to start with Robert Groves, Chief Medical Officer and EVP at Banner Aetna. Dr. Groves, let's start with an inspiring example of a program that has made a meaningful impact during your career. And then, then we'll talk a little bit about how the listeners can clone the core components of the program to do something similar. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Eric. I, yeah, I wanna take, uh, take us way back to 2005 to start this uh, narrative because I was at Banner Health at the time, not Banner Aetna, which is a joint venture between Banner Health and Aetna. And we rolled out something called the tele-ICU or EICU is the other name for it. And, uh, you know, it was a, uh, there's a couple of themes that run through uh, my ideas about what we can do in healthcare. And I want to start there because it is truly 
uh, a population health management strategy. In this case, the population happens to be critically ill patients that are housed in the ICU. So EICU basically is an audio visual connection to every ICU bed, uh, coupled with uh, a set of algorithms that are constantly looking at all the data coming off of those patients to try and identify adverse trends. And there were really four principles that uh, made this work for us the way it did. Uh, the first was because we had board certified intensivists in the core, and that's the room where we're hooked up to all 400 ICU beds, uh, uh, we could respond to requests for help from the bedside virtually immediately and quite literally virtually immediately. And, and that's a huge benefit, particularly when you have inexperienced ICU nurses, as we often do today. The second principle is that we did good housekeeping. And in the ICU, that means doing the things that we all agree we should do every day for each individual patient based on their diagnosis. Um, and then the third thing is the set of algorithms. And this is before, you know, large language models, but we did have algorithms, uh, you know, we, that's been around for a while. And it would look at every patient's data and look for adverse trends. And the idea is then we could intercede, interrupt before those adverse trends become adverse outcomes. And then the final thing, of course, is to measure what we do so that we can continuously improve. Uh, this is a form of population health management. And I'm going to suggest to you that it is also consistent with uh, uh, a term coined by our friends at Verta Health, uh, Sami Inkinen and his crew called it uh, continuous remote care. And you may say, well, gosh, they're in the ICU. What do you mean? Well, the doc is in the room maybe five minutes, twice a day. Uh, the nurse is in the room, but they have all kinds of other duties. The computer was never sleeping. And the doctors were always available 24-7 to respond if something came up. And so using that system over the course of about a decade and a half, we were able to show that uh, compared to Apache predicted uh, uh, severity adjusted outcomes, that we were 20 to 30% better than Apache predicted. And what that translates to is uh, tens of thousands of lives over 12 years. I think it was 15,000 lives saved. Uh, and about $800 million saved in that same time frame. So an incredibly effective program. And I would add one other point, and that's during the pandemic, it was huge to have this system. So you didn't have to send a nurse in the room every single time something came up. You could use the audio visio connect, video connection, talk to the patient directly, pan, tilt, zoom camera, zoom in on anything you want. And so it was a huge benefit during the pandemic as well. And that is my first uh, uh, experience with not only patient safety, that intentional redundancy, we didn't replace anybody at the bedside, but also that continuous remote care. And that theme has been there throughout my uh, 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 days with Banner Health and when I joined Banner Aetna back in 2017. Okay, let me, that was great. Let me repeat some of that back. So four key principles to, to, to executing on this. One, having an immediate response, and that was a combination of having qualified, experienced nurses at the bedside and intensivists in the central command station, so to speak. Two, right. uh, uh, good, good housekeeping, making sure that uh, the patient gets the, you know, the, the, the right literature and, and all the evidence, you know, gets the, the practices are applied or evidence-based. Uh, right. Three is the algorithm uh, and monitoring for different things uh, for adverse trends so you could have an immediate response. And I think the fourth was sort of uh, measure what we do that can, so that there could be continuous uh, quality improvement. Sounds like you've read some Deming books uh, throughout, the <laughs> throughout the process. And, and, and you sort of synthesize this as best, best practices or principles tied to con continuous remote care. It, 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 it impacted... Uh, over the time of this program in place, 20 to 30% improvements. But the principles of these can be applied to a chronic care, you know, continuous remote care can be applied to any chronic care program that you're probably uh, launching, whether as a health plan or a health system, and just could go beyond the ICU. And, and did I capture all of that correctly so far? That is absolutely correct. Bi-directional uh, communication, yes, that's exactly right. Okay, so for, before I let you off the hot seat, uh, just some, how would it, how would a listener uh, right now think about building this at their organization? Like, what are one or two things they should start with? How would you go about this? 
uh, if we're going to take sort of the principles from the tele ICU, apply it to an asthma program, uh, a diabetes program, a weight loss program, or anything like that. Yeah, and, and it can apply to any program, any chronic disease. I'll give you a quick example. We have a cardiology practice in the West Valley, Cardiac Solutions, that has implemented a, a VIP technology. And it's really the same thing. It is uh, an electronic uh, connection that lives on the cell phone and patients have the ability to communicate with uh, the care team, uh, you know, seven days a week. They have the ability to get an immediate response. They share information bi-directionally. What's your weight today? You know, how's your heart rate, et cetera. And uh, there can be applied to that a, a set of predictive algorithms to identify those people who are looking like they're getting into trouble. And then, of course, we can measure what we do. And we've applied that, the, all of those same principles to congestive heart failure. So those patients who are at high risk of readmission, uh, they get this VIP program and they are connected to the system in, in those four ways that you just mentioned. Love it. Great start. Love that stuff. This is why you subscribe to the show, everyone. You're going to get guests with answers like that. Uh, let's talk about uh, Independence Blue Cross, and we're going to bring in uh, Dr. Ritika Kumar, again, Independence Blue Cross. Uh, she runs Market Clinical Solutions and Pharmacy Services for IBC. Motherhood was one such program that we did with, um, you know, our partners at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and what that program started with is essentially, and unfortunately, these these stats have actually gotten worse through the pandemic but you know i think most most folks not even non even non clinicians would have probably heard this by now maternal mortality rates in the united states are worse than any developed country in the world and we actually got worse through the pandemic than better uh, and heart safe motherhood was a program that we did a pilot that we did with uh, university of pennsylvania where women that were high risk for developing preeclampsia were sent home with blood pressure cuffs, um, digital blood pressure meters. They were enrolled in a program where it was a telephonic two-way conversation. We were bringing in their digital readings and it was timely interventions based on what those readings were. But these moms were now safely able to stay home with their newborn but they were deeply integrated and engaged with the healthcare system where it wasn't where someone's going to be lost to care or they're going to go home and then they're going to spike a blood pressure and we're going to have adverse outcomes. So what this program essentially did for us was we caught a lot of um, still elevated pressures post, post discharge, brought those women in, they got timely treatment and, and um, intervention. And the outcomes were the, from the program were in terms of lower mortality and morbidity and those folks, those women that participated in the program essentially has brought us to a place where now we were expanding it to our entire network. Um, and, you know, we, we do these pilots where it's like, we're trying to solve an issue. We've, we've thought there's, there's an intervention where what are the challenges? What does, what are the challenges the intervention is going to solve for? What were the outcomes? And if it's a truly successful outcome, then we take that and, and roll it out to the rest of the network as a best practice. Well, I love that. And actually, it, it sounds like I'm going to just summarize a bit what I just heard you say. It, it does match a little bit about what Robert laid out as far as core principles. So we're looking partnership with the University of Pennsylvania. So you have a good sort of uh, you, obviously the providers involved. You're looking at the high risk preeclampsia members those digital meters, so important to get that data, the connection through the telephonic program. So now we're getting uh, data that's being sent in real time, identifying folks that are exceptionally at high risk, intervention through the telephone. Uh, the mother's obviously much happy, ha wants to be at home with the newborn uh, to take care of the newborn. So now they're connected with the providers. The data provides those, warming, those warnings. And next thing you know, the results to the pilot are so effective, you're, you're rolling this out to the rest of your membership. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think the one additional, you know, good side effect that comes out of this is a lot of the pitfalls of health care are also lack of health literacy amongst the people that we're trying to treat, right? And them not truly understanding what does a particular diagnosis mean. And part of this program and the engagement is also to get this individual to understand that your preeclampsia also puts you at risk for developing hypertension later in life. 
And what are the things you could do? What are the behaviors that you could you could build in, into your life, you know, lifestyle, et cetera, that could either help you prevent that or make you aware that that's something you got to keep an eye on and make sure you get regular care. And are we, uh, are we talking commercial population here? Are we talking Medicaid? We've, we've, we've got, so we've enterprise wide, we've got both managed care, Medicare, commercial, uh, self-funded, and then uh, managed care, Medicaid population. This sure. population was mostly commercial, uh, just because Medicare, there tends to be, you know, less women that would qualify for Medicare in the childbearing age. Um, but we typically will share these best practices that we've learned with our Medicaid plan partners as well um, under the under the family umbrella. And I think the one reason we like to do this with provider partners is, yes, our members benefit, but when we've established this as a best practice across the enterprise, everybody benefits. Yeah, I love it. Great stuff. You know, when... Uh... When we talk about chronic care management, you know, often we're talking about these human interventions. You've heard our two uh, physicians uh, on a roundtable talk about interventions with at the bedside through even virtual care. Uh, so provider or coach to the to the consumer. Yeah, this is often contradictory, right, to to scale. So I'm going to bring in Sebastian Sagar. He's the CEO and co-founder of Scene Health. And I'd love you to talk about, Sebastian, a bit of the impact face-to-face -face interventions have because they're so important, but then how do we enable health plans and providers and of the like to do this at scale and maybe provide us with a story or a real example? Sure, sure. So um, I really did like the, the tele or the EICU example. <clears throat> and I think those principles, Dr. Grover, are excellent. In the in-hospital setting, that's an, a really acute setting. The first thing, the first principle partially is described in what's called the Hawthorne effect. When you see something and you can see it more efficiently when you centralized it, that observation is empowering because then you can react quickly. And in the case of an ICU, you can save a life, right? In, the, um, in a different setting. So if you think about the chronic condition setting, it's not that minute to minute, it's a day-to-day -day type of dynamic. And um, for chronic conditions, you can imagine you're you're getting let's say you're getting discharged you have a lot of it a lot of instructions what you're supposed to do ongoing on a day-to-day -day basis some things you have to do right away um but the fact is that the things that happen next are not rocket science they are described in your second point dr grove the the standards there are standards for what have to happen next but from the healthcare systems perspective it's a black hole and that timeliness of reaction, um, that's that's really gone. If you don't have the data, you don't understand, for example, did the person get the, lo the labs drawn at follow-up? Um, can the patient take the medication that they've been prescribed? You know, Can they inject it, for example, or are they even taking medication? So the reason face-to-face -face is so powerful is because it actually works to solve a problem. Um, so how can we deliver that at scale is the question you're asking, Eric. And let's let's just imagine it for the outpatient setting that you could send a community health worker to someone's house every day to make sure that they're taking their medication, they can change a bandage, et cetera. It would work, but but for the fact that it's extremely expensive. And if you think about the Medicaid setting, people aren't at, aren't at home, right? So you may might not even find that at home. Um, so, but generally speaking, in healthcare, um, this Hawthorne effect, this observer effect is so powerful for two reasons. One, uh, you can support somebody, you can help somebody if you know what the problem is. And two, you can hold them accountable. In healthcare, it's, and especially in Medicaid, it's more the former, you're trying to help somebody. Um, and, that, and that's where uh, a really magical thing that you can deploy is video and not just video like in the EICU setting where it's synchronous and you're live, but for the chronic conditions, asynchronous, which is a fancy way of saying recorded video, like Snapchat or like Instagram, and deployed under the right settings with the right protocol, you can take away not only geographical ba barriers, but you can take away scheduling barriers, time, right? So, so two people can have a face-to-face, -face, independent of where they are, and at different times. I, I like I'll that. Give you an example as well, Eric. If you yeah, like so I was to. looking. Perfect. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, in in one case, a national health plan 
um, deploys asynchronous video. They've been doing this for about two years to help people take medication for diabetes, asthma, hypertension, now even sickle cell disease, um, inhalers for COPD, now also Dr. Rove CHF, and that's in both Medicaid and, and, and in DSNP. Um, but they're not just deploying the, of this back and forth video, they, they treat it holistically. Um, to even get this to patients, you have to be able to outreach and enroll them into the program to begin with, right? And then in some cases, think back to that discharge example, uh, people have to be linked into care. They need a, pres a, a provider to even prescribe medication. They might need labs drawn in order to understand what dosages are right. And did they even pick up the medication? Uh, but, but finally, then they are deploying asynchronous video, and this is nationally, in 30-day increments. So it could be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. They're, it's like they're prescribing it um, to solve things that would be a piece of cake face-to-face. -face. So for example, do you know how to inject insulin? Um, if you're taking blood pressure, your blood pressure for hypertension, do you know how to use the blood pressure monitor correctly? Uh, simple questions like, um, uh, are you um, are you supposed to take this medication in conjunction with the other medication, or uh, I'm you know I'm feeling lightheaded? Is that a normal effect of this medication, or due to something else? Or, or even like things that are just holistically important to chronic disease management, like how nutrition could help them feel better and lower blood pressure. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I still don't understand how I, I get with my my kids in these long text exchanges when like it'd be easier just to press the video and record the video and say something or audio and send it to them. And, well, that's what that's what they think. That's what they're doing, right? right. So. <laughs> Much more effective. So I like this. I just want to summarize this real quick. So the Hawthorne effect is really important. This whole concept of so this, the centralized observation enables you to react more quickly as a culture provider and is also probably more influential when trying to drive uh, a, a response or an engagement or even a, 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 a behavior uh, from the consumer, the the patient on the other the other end, and and, allow, and then also you you mentioned timeliness of the reaction, which is critical, and the accuracy of the data, including non clinical, is important. So like being able to ascertain if someone could physically take their meds or redress their own wounds or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and like Dr. Grove pointed out, there are some scenarios where technology can allow you to do these standards according to standards, but do it more efficiently and at scale. Okay. And and medication taking is one of those. Let's um let's jump to uh let's stay with scale. I I wanna I wanna sort of have a, a bit of a a counterpunch to face to face, uh, not a totally counterpunch, but but we'll, we'll make it exciting here. Uh, so Robert, how is Banner Aetna gaining scale from the network of your PCPs? Yeah, you know this this is uh, 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 one of the issues that that uh, plagues every health system is how do we bring physicians up to date with uh, current technology tools? And by the way, that's what they are. They're tools. They're not really replacing anything. They're improving efficiency. And if we're using them correctly, we're using them to enhance uh, what gives people meaning and purpose, and that's human relationships. So that's what we're trying to do. And our docs are not quite there yet to be able to get to the ideal world where, uh, you know, my primary care doctor uh, has me connected to uh, continuous uh, uh, remote uh, care in his office with his care team. And so we seek out point solutions. And one of those point solutions that we sought out uh, was a company called 98.6. And what they do, first of all, they're deeply integrated into our system. Uh, they, they, uh, they share records, they communicate with the primary care physician, but it's a telemedicine strategy. The difference in what, it, uh, what they're doing is uh, it's on demand, rather than setting up a face-to-face -face video appointment, it's on-demand text-based care. Uh, and so uh, it's free to our membership. They can use it anytime and, and, and they can be texting uh, first with a bot that makes it scalable. It does the intake, asks the questions, you know, about what's going on, et cetera, and past medical history, all of that stuff. And then within minutes, you're talking to a board certified primary care uh, 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 physician. 
And uh, it, that makes it incredibly convenient. I mean, you think about it, you could be in a board meeting and you got, oh gosh, I got to, I, I forgot, I've got to get something done about this and such. And maybe you shouldn't be distracted in the board meeting, but you could be, you could text right then and there and start getting answers to your questions without interfering with your life. Now, uh, having said that, uh, the uh, ability for on-demand video is always there and it's used not infrequently, but the vast majority of the stuff that folks uh, contact them for is managed through that. It's essentially real time, but asynchronous communication in that it's text-based. Love it. I, I want to uh, run a little bit behind schedule for everyone to know. We'll try to catch up in the air here. I told everyone I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our partners. Something about the show, and we've been doing this show uh, for well over 10 years now. We can't produce this weekly programming without the support of partners. And we have the luxury because we've been doing the show for a long time and we get this tremendous audience. So thank you all for listening and watching that we could sort of handpick some of the organizations we bring in who are uh, aligned with the content we want to cover. So Scene Health, who's our partner today, they came out of John Hopkins and they developed uh, what is now the most extensive catalog of peer-reviewed publications among medication adherence companies. And as you're getting the sense, they have this uh, platform called Med Engagement that uses this one-to-one -one async video, as Sebastian mentioned in, in his Bright Spot story, to deliver medication support at scale. And they are going what I would call beyond what's traditional med adherence to transform all of disease management. And, and I think about it this way, this is sort of how I conceptualize it, not their marketing words, but mine, but it's like a GPS, a sophisticated one that guides you to the best possible route via rush hour. So like traditional medication adherence may serve like a compass, right? Provides direction, but it's limited in scope and data. Seen is the sophisticated GPS and they provide this personalized comprehensive support and guidance that goes well beyond that compass, well beyond just mere medica medic medication adherence. So like Waze does, everyone probably has used Waze at one point, they not only warn you of hazards on the road or an accident, but they also provide guidance around those obstacles. So seen is not just about those medication reminders, but a personalized approach that includes a nurse, a health coach, directly observed therapy via video, supported by various member incentives, nudges, motivational interviewing, and educational motivational video content that is data-driven and tailored to each member's unique journey. So they help members get better fast, they get to the doctor, get their meds, take them as prescribed, and get their labs and vitals, driving cost-effective utilization, scalable, and they improve multiple clinical and quality measures in as little as 90 days. So it's truly a remarkable leap forward in scalable chronic care management and a bright spot in healthcare. I like how I brought that in there. Uh, a bright spot in healthcare, but they truly are. And we're sure, certainly really uh, thankful that they're part of uh, episodes like this. So I, I want to move off uh, into um, from examples specifically around programs, again, more into ROI and strategy. And so everyone listening now, Sebastian is thinking like, how do you measure some of these programs? And I, I, I think one of the best approaches to enhancing an overall strategy uh, or even adopting a new one or uh, to replace an old one starts with this measurement stuff and not just measurement, but challenging the status quo of how we measure and what we measure. So are you, are, are you measuring the most relevant or essential data points to determine an accurate ROI on a program or a business and, and I'd like, you know, the thing that I think about as I ask this question is the movie Moneyball and the book Moneyball. Some of you probably read the book. A lot of you probably saw the movie, uh, but like Moneyball for value-based care. And if you don't know Moneyball, uh, the brief description is it's about a general manager in baseball. Don't worry, it's not a sports. Well, it is a sports story, but it has mu much bigger applications. He came, this Billy Bean, the general manager, is featured in the movie. Uh, he, Brad Pitt, I think, plays him. He discovers that, hey, there are some metrics that are being undervalued by all his competitors about how to score more runs. People typically looked at batting average and home runs, but really on-base percentage and some other metrics that were undervalued in the marketplace were actually higher correlators to scoring runs and winning. And so he started investing in assets and players that had those numbers tied to them, that did better with those numbers. They were less expensive. And he was able to create an incredibly competitive team over a decade 
uh, with a much smaller payroll than his competitors. And so uh, with that as a background, I wonder how can we bring Moneyball, uh, how could specific health plans, I guess, Sebastian, bring Moneyball into their thinking around value-based care and value-based measurements? Yeah, so um, looking for the silver bullet stat or metric uh, like in Moneyball is complicated, but I but I do know, for example, what happens when in healthcare you chase the wrong metrics, and uh, probably the the most likely cul culprit right now are the medication adherence measures. And health plans always think about when they hear that when they even when they hear medication adherence, they think the refill metrics. Um, so these are like proportion of days covered or MPR, typically for diabetes, hypertension, for statins, asthma has one. And um, like in some of the stats that typically baseball looked at uh, before before that book or movie came out, they create a ton of waste. So the pharma, so these pharmacy metrics are a total double whammy. You could spend a ton of money to get people refilled on medication, but if they don't take them or if they don't take them correctly, they're still going to the hospital and you now have increased pharmacy spend. And pharmacy spend is is really through the roof right now. And all health plans are very, very concerned about it. And there, there are also downstream metrics that come out of false metrics. So um, for example, uh, if you if you hear med adherence, you might think about pharmacy call centers now, which is really unfortunate for pharmacists that they end up, you know, highly trained clinicians end up in call centers doing refill calls. And what are their metrics? What is What's their money ball right now? How many CMRs can you complete in a day? Or what's the average time you spent on a call with a patient? Lower, you know, a lower number being better. Um, so what, let's think about like high level, what actually matters for medication? Well, in a, in a clinical trial, what were they actually tested for? So they're tested for the outcome that they produced. So why wouldn't that matter for a health plan more than anything? So for example, if you, if you are on medications for diabetes, shouldn't A1C be your ultimate North Star or uh, blood pressure for for someone with hypertension. And I, I do think that a while ago, you know, you know, 10 years ago, when some of these pharmacy metrics came out, they were a great idea because access to medication was a big problem. So, so they're still important. Uh, but, but it's not going to really matter if you don't actually take them or take them correctly. Um, so I guess on the um, ways analogy, it would be like saying, okay, let's measure whether people go to their doctor's appointment by checking whether they refill their gas in their car, right? Um, I know it's a, it's a little bit off track, but we can do a lot better when it comes to, um, to medications by just, mon just measuring what the actual outcome was that the medications are intended to, to get to. What about an example real quick? Sure, so um, Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland, uh, comes to mind immediately. They've been way out in front of this for a long time. And as they, in their Medicaid line of business, for example, now also, also in DSNP, their quality managers are thinking about all of the quality metrics with an end goal in mind first. So for example, they want to keep people out of the hospital. They want to keep, keep people from going to the emergency room. And they're looking at the, the, like, for example, the comprehensive set of diabetes metrics as outcome based. So we want to get to A1C improvement. We want to get to a blood pressure improvement. And the incredible thing is by using a, you again, of course, using asynchronous video, you get the face to face, um, you get the face to face contact you need to actually audit that what you're doing is producing the benefit that, that the medications are intended to. So particular patient story comes to mind that has been shared, I think on, um, by Care First is a patient named Michael started the program with an A1C of, of 10.7 a year later by doing something very basic, taking medication every day the right way. Um, he was at a 6.6 .6 and 18 months later at a 5.8 and off of insulin, which was incredible. And it, it's not really rocket science here, um, but it is taking quality metrics and not just looking to, to score the actual metric, but getting to the health outcome that lies behind it. Um, so, so in the end, guess what? Uh, when people take their medication correctly, they actually refill 
their medication. Um, and C Care First has actually proven that when it comes to uh, diabetes medications, hypertensive medications, statins now as well. And it shows in, in the results on their, their quality metrics too. You know, I, I in preparation for this, uh, I had asked your team sort of to write up some of that data because I, I wanted to get that like, that case study kind of down. I, I'm wondering, one, maybe we could share that with the group here if they want to see it because it's, it's an interesting blueprint if people want it on, on how to kind of execute a program like that. And then, you know, the other thing, you know, is it really just money ball or just overall this whole, you know, ways version of bed uh, disease management. I'm wondering if people could pick your brain a bit, Sebastian. So if you're okay with it, I'd like to one, offer everyone who wants that case study, we'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. And if you want to be introduced to Sebastian and the team, just to pick their brain on the money ball concepts of measurement, or even some of the components of this program and how to execute it, you could, um, I'll, I'll introduce you to him and I'll make a warm intro offline. So I'm going to, Sherry, why don't you throw up a poll and we could kind of like people want it. I'll, I'll do that. Beautiful. All right. So let's, let's go come back to independence. And, and so Rita, I'm going to bring you back in and I want to stay with the same theme, but like how is independence, how have, you know, how is independence blue cross enabled better care management and overall just navigation amongst your in-house team to, to remain, you know, to, to keep scale going. So I'll tell you, I've been in managed care for about 14 years. And one of the biggest challenges used to be, especially from a care management perspective, is you, you, you know, the old traditional way your nurses or your case managers, nutritionists, pharmacists, who whatever the skill set is, would get a list of people to call. And about 70% of the time, what would be in the chart would be in your medical record would be unable to reach, right? Right. Um, it was a source of frustration for the folks trying to do the work. It was high cost spend on the plan side and not achieving the outcomes that we wanted. So what we've done at Independence is we've actually spent a lot of work. We've invested a lot in our data scientists. We do a lot of collaborative work with MIT and Wharton and Penn. Uh, we've actually built a stratification model that in, that brings in all sorts of data, claims data, you know, your traditional medical data, like Rx data, uh, but also social data. Um, and then we have data that comes in from all the health systems with real-time admission discharge ADI data feeds, right? Um, we've, through this stratification engine, we've also layered it with models that say, who who are we likely to impact and who are we likely to engage? So. So those people that have been identified as folks that we can actually, we'd want to focus on, then go through the stratification of, here are the people you should spend your highest cost resources to actually engage them because they will actually pick up our calls. Our engagement rates went from 30% to now 86% when our, when our coaches call, call individuals. Everybody else, there's a digital engagement model. And the digital engagement isn't just, we're just sending you a random text that, hey, you know, go get your prostate exam, but we have no clue if you've had it or not, or colonoscopy, and we've got no clue. These are very targeted messages that are driven by what's going on in that individual's journey. And it's not just a message about what, why we're asking you to do something. It's also the next best action that's baked into that message so we can track the outcome. So it would go to, if we've identified a cohort of 300 women that are behind on their mammograms, the message is going to say why mammograms are important, you know, the, the benefit of timely screening and catching cancers early, but then it's also going to have an embedded link where it can, it says, here's a link to schedule your mammogram close to where you are. Um, and it, it takes them to that, you know, ability to schedule the mammogram. And then we not only track did our messages, how many messages were opened? Did what we want the message to do, did that intention happen? So of the people that opened it, clicked it, how many clicked through and actually did schedule that mammogram? How many, how many mammograms happened? And this goes across the entire spectrum of conditions, gaps, diseases, ER visits. You know, you could have gone to your PCP for this or urgent care, or by the way, you got, you know, do you know you have a tele, telemedicine benefit? So we also track, are our messages impactful? Are, the, are our messages doing what we need them to do or do we need to tailor them differently? Do we need to, there's 
uh, A-B testing even on the way messages are written to see are we having the impact. So what we've done with this, you know, to what Dr. Groves, it's a population health management model. It's about making sure the people that are doing the right thing are getting, you know, accolades for doing the right thing. It's to make sure people that are maybe ticking time bombs that we don't yet know about, we can encourage them to do the right thing, put them on the right journey, get people to start using their benefits because a lot of people don't. And that's when you've got the catastrophic stuff that happens. And the third is the folks that are possibly struggling. How do we find those folks? How do we make sure they know that we're here to help support them? And last piece is for our care managers, health coaches, pharmacists, behavioral health specialists, medical director, whoever is going to engage the member, we've actually built a 360 dashboard where that individual can look at that dashboard and know everything about that individual they're going to call. So we're not going to be interviewing that member to try and get to know them. We know what's going on before we call them. So it's a very meaningful dialogue. We know who your PCP is, who, what are the specialists you're seeing? When was the last time you saw them? Did you go to the ER? What was the diagnosis you went for? What are the medications you're on? What was the last time you filled them? Um, what are your labs looking like? So we've got a lot of details. So what this has done is it's actually even improved our retention within our teams because the people that are doing this work are loving doing it because they see that they can make an impact. And we're seeing the outcomes. We did a study uh, to see, we used a cohort that wasn't man managed, you know, match cohort, not intervened by health coaches. A control group. To a, yeah. a control group to a cohort that was intervened by health coaches. And what we got through that study is that we, our coaching model from the stratification engine data-driven model has delivered within three to six months of engagement, we generate close to $996 PMPM in savings for that individual that has now been engaged. And what we saw was you continue to see the reward even after the coaching ended, because we knew we were able to impact health literacy and, and get them engaged into the healthcare system in a healthy way. Wow, another successful pilot at IBC. Do, do, Robert, this is this, across the book. This is across the book. This is right, you, you, you started it versus the control group, and then you probably expanded it. Yeah. So we we built the model, but we always like to test: is our model doing what we sure. had intended it to do, or do we need to pivot? Do we need to change? The right. intention is let's fail fast, so that we're you know using our resources wisely. And if it's not delivering what we need to deliver, then those models evolve, and we constantly add new models to to the infrastructure. Robert, does this resonate with you guys? And what are you doing at Banner at, uh, to, to provide scale for your care management team? Yeah, you know, uh, care management historically, uh, I was, you know, when I first moved over to uh, the administrative side of healthcare after being in private practice for many years and complaining about lots of stuff that I got to see firsthand and understand why it's so difficult. Uh, I was surprised that care management really is telephonic. You know, people were, you know, trying to call folks at home, not getting in touch with them. So we, we're we interested in flipping that model. And what we'd like to do is apply the same principles that I've already described to, uh, to care management, continuous remote care. And the way you do that is by either, you know, we, we're commercial and individual market by uh, inducing folks to sign up for this digital app that's on their phone uh, so that we know how to outreach to them now. They know how to reach out to us, which before had been almost impossible, right? And then you can use the algorithms that predict risk, readiness to engage, et cetera, to prioritize those folks that you speak with first. Obviously, we want to get in touch with uh, folks who have been in the hospital and have already had an event, but we're getting better at better at predicting who is going to likely get into trouble. And so getting those folks engaged with an app, and by the way, the app is not just about bilateral communication. And, and uh, when you've got awake alert folks out in the world, you can also create community there. You can have groups that share their experiences together, right built into that. You can have uh, online content, uh, you know, asynchronous video. There's all kinds of things that you can do with the technology today. And so we're looking at applying that to care management, we think that will allow us yep. to expand the scope significantly and significantly improve both the member experience and our employees' experience and for the same reasons that uh, Dr. Kumar just mentioned, because they know they're making a difference. It's starting to work. 
like that. You know, Sebastian, I'm going to hop around a little bit because we're a little bit tight on time. Uh, I, I would love to come back to pharmacy and video and how health plans are measuring that too. Like what, what's the impact on HEDIS, for example? Can you share maybe an example there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, well, you have to, you have to look at the, um, you, you need a structure for looking at outcomes in a really deliberate way that takes time into account. So the first, the first level is short-term, like Dr. Grove was saying, you need to get engagement. If you're not going to penetrate like a certain membership to a certain extent, your, your effect on the whole population is going to be minimal. Um, so it's about velocity and penetration of your, of the engagement. And then at, at around four to six months, you can start looking to, to actually the health outcomes and the quality outcomes. So where is A1C and where was it before? You can already start to look at that at about six months um, for a particular member. Uh, and then for six months, so you can see refills start to pick up if it's for statins. Um, you could see blood pressure, for example, uh, reducing at around that time. Um, and then at, at, at around 12 months, that's when you get the big payoff. So are people going to the hospital more or are they going less? Uh, which And what's that cost savings? Um, so, and, and of course, as uh, Dr. Kumar mentioned, controlled as well. So you need a control cohort to see if that effect is attributed to your program, other programs, adjust for regression of the mean, et cetera. So there, there are a few things here. And I think it, it does get complex and you need, um, you need to marry, I would say three different, different dynamics here. The first is, and we've, and Dr. Kumar actually hit on a lot of this. Um, you have a, you have a population health strategy, right? Which you can use data to inform. So, you know, for you've got to know that a certain member hasn't picked up medication in a while or their last A1C was a year ago. You need to already know that. Um, but that's not going to drive your member to member communication. At the member level, you have to be able to engage and understand barriers to care, barriers to adherence, and, uh, and, and execute. You've got to be able to resolve those. And then finally, the data sophistication required. Um, to understand how those interventions match or are reflected in a claims outcome, or if you're getting data in from a health information exchange, like in Maryland, we have an incredible HIE, uh, and marrying that to the outcome, that is really, really critical. So if you can, if you can marry up both a reporting structure that's like short, middle, long-term with three different approaches, which is pop health, member to member, and then finally, claims data analysis. Um, and if you could, if you can bring those things together, then, then you can understand the impact of your intervention and make sure that whatever that intervention is costing you, you're, you're driving at least the same amount of cost savings, if not double or triple. You know, sort of staying on that theme, I'm going to, I'm going to bring in actually real quick, our next live episodes, March 7th, we always do our live episodes Thursdays at 12. Uh, it's called the Evolution of Specialty Value-Based Care. If you want my team to register you so you don't have to go through the registration process again, uh, we'll put up a poll and we'll register for you for that live event that will convert to a podcast the next day as all of our live episodes do. Uh, Sebastian, I'm going to keep you on, but I, I want to bring in also uh, Ritika and Robert because this is an interesting one from the audience. I think it's on point with what you just said around uh, measuring and, and distilling down from population to high risk to claims data analysis. So have, how applicable is our programs like this in the long-term care environment? Like it seems like the biggest expenses for a, a patient to ever experience in long-term care is around, you know, uh, med adherence and, and it could be saved by potentially direct contact video uh, it could, you know, if you think about diabetes, people who forget their insulin and all that. So, so keep up with snacks, all that stuff. So it's a, it, thank you for the question, by the way. And to you from our audience, but how would you think about that? And then I'll bring in our two medical leaders. Do you want me to take that really quick? Go, Go ahead. ahead. I, I, so, so I was a practicing hospitalist in an academic medical center, most of my clinical um, experience, but then also worked at a managed care plan where we were practicing physicians under that managed care plan. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges with long-term care facilities is the lack of adequate clinical oversight um, and timely intervention when something goes wrong. 
um, or the ability to even catch those where something will go wrong because if you've got the ability to monitor closely. So Dr. Groves's um, you know, ICU model, I would think would go so well in the in the long-term care uh, facilities and what happens there. Because what happens there today is people go in and out of ERs and hospitalizations. Um, and it's a poor experience for the individual. It definitely is an extremely high cost for cost burden for you know the society and and whatever you know um, the funding mechanism is for that individual, but also for for a family and caregivers, et cetera. So I think the those should it be solved exists, right? How could we it be solved? we're We're now in in the era of um, you know, you've got digital monitors that that directly can feed into a centralized station where you're getting blood pressure readings and sugars, um, temperatures, you know, someone's headed up, you know, you probably need to do that urine test really fast to see a, a something brewing that you need to treat, right? So not not to go down rabbit holes, but I think there's, there's immense um, opportunity there to say, how do you create ways to have a higher acuity of supervision without adding, you know, too much cost, so you still have an ROI, but you can have timely interventions by practitioners who are really equipped to make those decisions and good decisions uh, that will that will impact the outcome. Robert, why don't you go? Do you have a re you don't have to answer this, but do you have a reaction to it as well? And then we'll bring in Sebastian. Uh, did you ask me that? I'm sorry, I missed. Yeah, I, I did. Okay, yeah, I I absolutely agree, and and you know as the as the cost of technology comes down, it becomes more and more viable. I mean, when, back in 2005, we had to have special cameras and special this and that. And now, you know, you, you got an app on a phone and a webcam and you can do this stuff. And so I think that it's very ripe for that kind of, and I agree with Dr. Kumar that that's one of the areas where it is most needed to be able to extend uh, the capability of the limited staff that they have in long-term care. Early in my career, I was the medical director for a 300-bed long-term care unit, and the problems that Dr. Kumar described are exactly right, and we have the technology today to solve that, and so I, I think it's a great idea. And we, you know, we were flexible with our EICU. We had a lot of rural hospitals, so we did some long-term care monitoring. Folks that, you know, didn't want to be transferred to the big city, at the time, the big city was Greeley, Colorado, so you know what population I'm talking about. But they didn't want to go to the big city. They wanted to stay in their local you know, uh, critical access hospital. With this same model, they might not be critically ill, but we could help decide who needed to come and who could stay with support from our team uh, to uh, continue to get them better. Sebastian? Yeah, and I, I certainly don't have the experience that Dr. Kumar and Dr. Groves have here with, with that setting, but I will say one thing, hospital at home is a ever increasing um, priority as the cost of care in facilities goes up. Um, and also just, just for the patient's health, just to have them in their in the home setting is critical. And I'll, I'll give you a massive glimmer of hope here, uh, which is which al always su surprises people when they hear this. And I think that this is pandemic. I think this is one of the better, you know, let's say the silver linings of the pandemic and back to that mid-Atlantic health plan I was telling you about in the uh, dual eligible and DSNP population, you'd be surprised to know, uh, and this is a comorbid population, diabetes, hypertension, the adherence rates are 30 to 40% higher um, in people in those programs. And they all tend older. The highest engagers are 60 to 70 years old with asynchronous video. And everybody thinks that our, for example, our pediatric asthma uh, program would have the highest engagement rate because it's adolescents who love Snapchat. Well, they they clearly don't like Snap Snapchat for medication as much as people who are 60 to 70 <laughs> years old and who lack people to talk to every day and who love the idea that um, you'd, you'd shoot a video and some a real person would like respond back to you. Um, so I think that there's tons of value in like the, the technical type of monitoring of certain vital signs and measurements, but there's also just the ability to be able to connect with another human being and do that in a way that is not an, not increased burden to the healthcare system. Because 
last I heard, there are not more doctors, there are not more nurses, there are not more healthcare workers. So we have to find modalities that can get to any place, any time, um, really, really efficiently and, and deliver all aspects of care, which is not just, uh, you know, vital sign monitoring, but actually like deliver actual care, right, to a person to a person. May I add something to that? Um, and not as much long-term care, but really quickly, you know, behavioral health has been on everybody's mind. Pandemic has uh, sort of accelerated, exacerbated a problem we already had. We did a program because of that's slightly similar where it's a collaborative care model where a primary care doc, family physician, oncologist, heart failure doc has access to a behavioral health doc. And in real time, they can actually do a consult, an e-consult, and get recommendations on treatment. So when that patient's been seen by this individual entity who may not feel equipped to treat that condition, we can they can start timely treatment. And it's been really well received in our network. Um, and we're doing something similar with Durham as well. Well done, everyone. Uh, I'm looking at the time. Um, it's a dangerous, with only two and a half minutes to go, if I ask you this last <laughs> question, uh, Ridica. So I'll let you decide. I mean, if we want, if you want, you want me to ask you the non traditional benefits, because I wanted to go there, but I don't know if you could cover it in the two and a half minutes. I'll, I'll speak really fast. All right. So if you, you know, <laughs> just provide some insights about how you're thinking about non traditional benefits, addressing both the clinical and non clinical health factors, and how you're building a program around that. So I think Sebastian referred to this, but we've built a social barrier risk index, which, which tells you at a zip code, at a member level, what could be the social barriers. Because a lot of times you could, you know, people have a lot of rich benefits and they've got access to the best of healthcare, but they don't get the care. And, and it typically, it tends to be one of those social reasons. So what we're now working with, and especially with some of our employer groups is, if you've got a community that has a food desert, you know, do we do we give them gift cards to maybe a, a grocery store that's near work that will incentivize them to, you know, to shop their groceries before they go home? If there's if there's a community, if there's employees that live in an area that is a transportation desert, do you give them, you know, access to Uber rides to be able to get to their appointments, et cetera? Um, caregiver burden is a real issue. We're looking at you know ways to solve for that where your employer could support some of that that isn't a traditional benefit but that non-traditional benefit now allows that individual to now be able to not just show up as a fully engaged employee giving their hundred percent but also be able to do the things that they need to do for themselves to stay healthy um so that's just a quick snippet of that yeah i love that we should be we, we've done a couple of episodes on around non-traditional supplement you know, benefits. We, we need to do more because it's going to be such a huge factor. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, thank you to the three of you for all the time and effort you took to participate and prepare for today. I really appreciate it. Uh, the preparation came through loud and clear. And for all of you uh, watching live, listening live, or, or just listening on, on, on a walk or on a weekend to the podcast episode, we hope that you use the ideas and bright spots shared during today's episode to inspire your thoughts and enhance your organization's current approach to improving healthcare for all of us. Tune in, uh, make sure you subscribe, tune in uh, on our next live episode on March 7th. And remember, this is all of yours. This is your Bright Spots and Healthcare Podcasts. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.